Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. As Helen said, my name is Malcolm Chapman, and I truly believe that at the heart of innovation, when we break it all down, it still centers on people. It's still about us. At its core, at its essence, it's still about us. The slide that's up right now really talks about you or me or us, and then we're going to look at that through this lens of the five powers that I talk about everywhere I go, because I think that they are that important, that we're going to have to have the five powers in our game if we're going to get to some better place. And the five powers are simply the power of imagination, the power of voice, the power of commitment, the power of change and transition, and the power of teamwork. And then we go through this mess, whatever this mess might be. That mess could be innovation, that mess could be good, it could be bad, but usually when we create something or change something or do something differently, we go through some sort of transition. And in the Marine Corps, we simply call that the mess. And then on the other side of that, we have innovative solutions, we have success, we have a different end game, and we have getting it done. Now I'm going to start by actually going back. You know, this whole thing about innovation and emerging technologies and new thoughts and new processes and ideas, I'm just going to ask you to calm down a little bit and take a deep breath. Because we've been here before. This is nothing new. In Ecclesiastics, it says there's nothing new under the sun. We've been here before. All of the changes, all of the technology, all of this is not new. Technology has changed how we listen to music. It's changed how we watch movies. Technology has changed how we work, how we share the written word. Technology has changed how we talk on the phone. Technology has changed how we navigate. But throughout all of this, it's still about listening to, for me, it's still about listening to Stevie Wonder. It's still about listening to music. It's still about the same essence, regardless of if it seems new or we're doing it on some sort of new piece of equipment, but it's still the same. Chris Brogan says that focusing on connecting with people and the tools will then all make sense. And I tend to agree with him, that it's still at its heart, it's about us, it's about people. And to be about people, I think I need to start this story off at the beginning, for me at least, at the beginning. And that was little Malcolm on the south side of Chicago, both a Cubs and a White Sox fan. This whole theory of liking both the Cubs and the White Sox, not the Cubs or the White Sox, but the Cubs and the White Sox, is a philosophical bin for how I think we need to think about society today. It's the genius of and, not the tyranny of or, but it's and. And and takes more work, but I think in the end, it's worth it. So my parents, that's my mother, Rosemarie Officer, who we affectionately call Tubby. That was the nickname given to her by her dad. And we all grew up calling her Tubby. And now, despite the fact that my parents separated when I was about five years old, my dad was never far from us. And that's my dad there in the center with my baby brother and I, my baby brother who I'm so proud of. I just retired as a Chicago police officer after 30 years. And in the background is my grandmother. And at five, I went to stay with my grandparents, William and Ida Chapman. And through all of these folks that have inspired me in my life, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, George and Hattie Officer, both of generations migrated to Chicago from the South and that great migration that took place of black folks from about 1915 to about 1970 Black folk move in great numbers from, to the, from the south to the north and to the west. My grandparents were part of that. And they moved to Chicago looking for work. My dad and my stepmom, my fifth grade picture. There was a shift that took place about fifth grade for me. And Mrs. Dawson, who's my fifth grade teacher, who is standing out there now, Mrs. Dawson taught me a couple of things in fifth grade. I don't remember anything from an education standpoint that me, what she taught me, but she taught me that there's no shortcut. She said, if you want to get from point A to point B, the only way to get there is by putting in the work and doing the work. 
Mrs. Dawson also said in fifth grade that at the heart of this is that, Malcolm, you're going to have to figure out how to work with people. You're going to have to figure out how to play well with people in the sandbox. As much as you might think that it's about you, it's not. It's about the contribution that you're making to something that's bigger, that's better, that's greater than you. I took Mrs. Dawson to heart in the fifth grade, and I started playing team sports. So I captained my high school basketball team. And after high school, I went to college, played basketball, and then joined the Marine Corps. And that was one of the best teams that I ever had the opportunity to serve on. And to me, understanding the essence of the Marine Corps about, again, making that contribution and creating something that's pretty special that wasn't created because of technology, but that was created because of people coming together, figuring out a process to work well together. After the Marine Corps, I worked for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals and then accidentally moved to the state of South Dakota. <laughs> Nowhere in my plans was it ever on my agenda to move to South Dakota. But I was working for Pfizer, accepted a position, sight unseen, moved to, thought I was moving to Chicago, back to Chicago. That's where my interview was. I ended up living in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, in the Radisson Encore Inn. And I lived in that hotel for about six months and eventually moved down to Sioux City, Iowa. Happened to be back in Sioux Falls one night with some of my boys, and I walk into a place that I frequented all the time called Champs on 41st Street. And I had a gaggle of guys with me, and we walk in and we see these ladies. So I threw my little Mag Daddy wrap on, and I stepped to one of them, and I asked her to marry me that night. She didn't say yes, but I closed the deal. I did. But when we decided to get married, my folks from Chicago had never met her family from Mitchell. So my dad and my stepmom and cousins and all come to Sioux City to stay with me. And we have two carloads of folks who look like me. And we leave Sioux City, Iowa, hit I-29, start heading north. And then we hit I-90 and start going west. And then I got off at Mitchell, and I couldn't remember where my future in-laws lived, even though I'd been to their home before. So I stopped a police officer, and I said, excuse me, can you come over? And he comes over, and he leans down and looks in the car. And he says, yes. And I said, can you tell me where the blacks live? <laughs> And he leaned back, and he looked at the cars behind, and he looked in my car again. And eventually, my best friend and best man said, Chap, the blacks. And I said, I'm sorry, Kermit and Dolores Black. That was their name. It never dawned on me by this picture that was created, <laughs> this visual of what he meant. So when we finally figured out where the blacks were, they hosted the black family <laughs> in Mitchell on our behalf. <laughs> it's my wife's maiden name. Our son Michael, who's sitting there, still gets a big kick out of it. It's like a black marrying a black. I love it. <laughs> but eventually from that, that's Kermit and Dolores Black, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. And my mother-in-law passed away about 18 years ago now. My father-in-law, still active, still a CPA in Mitchell. But these are folks, and all of these pictures that I'm showing, have made a tremendous impact on me and all of the things that I've been able to do. When I think about that, I think about the fact that I married up in life. My wife is a civil engineer, a math major, a PhD, a graduate of the School of Mines, so I did marry up, and I think I should get some credit for marrying up. <laughs> and then we have this cute little kid who's now a cute big kid who's now 17 years old. But again, all of these folks have contributed to create space for me in my life to be able to then go out and do the things that I like to do, where I think really is at the heart, again, about innovation, which is about us. Then I decided to do some heavy lifting. <laughs> and I asked my family if it was OK for me to run for city council. And I ran for the city council. And again, through the hard work of a lot of people in this community, I got elected in 2004 and was very proud of that time that I served on the city council. 
But again, what I loved about local government is that there were 10 voting members on the city council in Rapid City, and I contributed to the vote. I wasn't king. I didn't say, this is the way it's going to be. I made an informed contribution to how to pass ordinances in our community, not by myself, but with a group of other people. And I enjoyed that process of being a city council member. And through that process, I served on a National League of Cities board at a national organization representing all cities and towns across South Dakota. And that's a picture from 2009 at the inauguration of the first African-American president in our country's history, Barack Obama. And I was proud to be a Democrat, proud to be out there, and proud to be out there with my family. That's my wife, our son Alex, our, son, our daughter Leslie, and our son Michael. But again, I show these pictures not trying to say impressing anyone, but none of this happened in a vacuum and it didn't happen simply because of me. It happened because of us. That's us on the train, on the metro in DC. <laughs> I love this picture because I took our son, Alex, out of school for a week to go to the inauguration and I had a teacher tell me, well, he's gonna miss a week of school and we don't think that'll be good for him. And to me, these are the five powers. This is the power of imagination. So sitting down with my son who was in the fifth grade then, I said, we need to design some study for you during that week. And collectively, we came up with a program for him to do that he would interview someone from each of the 50 states and he would simply ask them two or three questions. Why are you here? Why is this important in our country's history? And what do you think about all this? And as he went around asking people, where are you from? Well, I'm from North Dakota. Well, I haven't talked to anyone from North Dakota. And we would scribe, my wife and I would take notes and scribe. And he put together a PowerPoint presentation that he went around the city of Rapid City teaching civics to not just fifth graders, but to teachers about what an inauguration was and why it was important. That's the power of imagination and that didn't happen because of technology, that happened because people got together to think differently about what it was that we were trying to do. That's the power of imagination. He thought it would be cool if not only he got to dress up one year for Halloween, but if his dad did too. So we simply call this clowning around with french fries. Malcolm and Alexander. The next power is the power of voice. And the power of voice, and during that year, we had Hillary Clinton out here so many times that uh, we took pictures, and my family thought this would be the coolest picture because they say, no one ever tells you to be quiet. <laughs> so that's the power of voice, where Hillary was saying, Malcolm, I've had enough. No more. She actually wasn't. He just happened to catch the camera in that angle. But when I think about the power of voice, I think about the power of voice where I say something, these speakers here today say something, I think as an audience, as a crowd, that's part of your responsibility to listen. I didn't say buy what we were selling, I just said listen. And in that listening, that's the way we start to create a new tomorrow by listening to each other, digesting it, then regurgitating some sort of response. And that happens both ways. Stephen Covey in his, in his book, Seven Habits for Highly Effective People, talk about the importance of not just hearing, but listening with your heart, and then owing other people that same responsibility to listen and then regurgitate as well. The next power is the power of commitment. And the power of commitment is about this commitment that I made to nearly 70,000 people in Rapid City once I was elected, and I took that pretty seriously. So much so that my colleagues around the state said that they thought I deserved the, municipal ex, uh, the Excellence Award in Municipal Government for the year 2008. And I'm pretty proud of that because that wasn't an award that I just won, that was an award that I thought we won. But again, I think at the heart of that are people coming together to do big things and big work. The power of commitment. Two years ago, my son had an accident where he fractured his skull and all I could think about was my commitment to this young man. And when I think about innovation, when I think about tomorrow, I think that we need to look no further than to look back to the future. That all we need to do is to look back at tomorrow by thinking about the folks that we're going to impact and who we're leaving this legacy to. And I couldn't help but to think that as I saw my son's 
laying there in bed like this. My commitment to him was beyond anything that I could even talk about. The commitment of caring to make sure that that kid got well because he has a huge debt that he needs to pay to society that we're empowering him to pay and to play. The power of commitment. It's my high school basketball coach who is still committed to us after all these years. He came to my brother's retirement party and said, Malcolm, as soon as you get the knowledge to one day retire, I'll come to South Dakota and do the same. My dad, who passed away when I think about change and transition, I am still going through this major transition of dealing with the loss of my dad. And I think that for me, of thinking about him and thinking about that connection with my son, I think that's where innovation happens. Every single time I look at my son and I talk to him about his grandfather. And the last power is the power of teamwork. And the power of teamwork is that it takes each and every one of us in this room to pull off big things. There's no one of us in this room who's as smart, as talented, as organized, as committed, as energetic as all of us. So when I think about those five powers of imagination, voice, commitment, change and transition, and teamwork, I can't help but to think that the way that we innovate is by making that investment in people. And thank you so much. Thank you.